Yeah, so let me just explain the procedure a little bit. So uh, we're going to speak for about 45 minutes or so. And uh, Morgan will present his, his thesis work, uh, after which we will open uh, the floor for questions from all of you. And uh, after that, maybe let's say 15 minutes of questions or so, and then we're going to ask you all to leave. Then the committee uh, will uh, basically have a, a meeting with, uh, with Morgan to ask him more questions, uh, maybe the less nice questions. <laughs> and then after that, uh, uh, we'll ask him to leave, and, and we'll deliberate, and then we'll, we'll bring him back in. So, um, and I believe we have some things afterwards organized. At, so. Okay, so it should be around two, in case you wanted to go. We should, sorry, around one o'clock. We should be done within two hours with the whole, with the whole process. Uh, <coughs> So I just want to say first thank you to the committee members, Eric Bernie Olsen and Sandy Kaplan for uh, serving on uh, Morgan's PhD. And I want to thank Morgan also for joining the lab a few years ago uh, and taking a chance on one of the new labs, new groups of the media lab. And uh, I think he's done some tremendous work, so we'll, we'll hear all about it. All right. <laughs> thank you, Iyad. Hey, guys. Thank you for coming. I'm really excited to tell you all about my research over the last few years using complex systems and data science as a lens to study AI and its impact in shaping the future of work. So of course, technological advancement is not a new trend and it's been this force that's been shaping human society for a long time now. However, experts and policymakers seem to agree that the types of technologies that are reaching maturity today represent some exciting new opportunities. So here I'm just highlighting some examples of what I mean. Of course, there's robotics and uh, the increases to productivity in manufacturing, for example, but also some more exotic examples in areas where it was traditionally thought that humans would always be the only uh, capable actors. For example, autonomous vehicles and considering the impact of this technology the potential impact of this technology on the US transportation system, or also considering as an example computer vision and its potential applications in medical diagnostics. In any case, we're seeing evidence that on aggregate, uh, these new opportunities in AI and cognitive technologies are representing new frontiers for innovation and entrepreneurialism. Uh, however, not everyone is necessarily excited about the impact of technological change. There's a lot of uh, pessimism out there. A recent Pew Research study found that Americans are really worried about the future of work and do not believe that the economy will create new jobs. So why do people feel this way? Well, there is some evidence that might support this pessimism. For example, growing productivity in the U.S. has not raised wages for all workers. Uh, so why, how is technology shaping labor and how does technology change the nature of work? Let's try to go through some examples and get a sense for this for this problem. So here's one example that was, this is a video that was released just on, on Friday, I think. So here's an exciting new robot from Boston Dynamics. And you can see it doing some physical work in a warehouse setting. It's able to balance on two wheels and maneuver while carrying boxes with different loads. I'm told it can carry up to 30 pound boxes. It's able to stack them in a coordinated way and then unstack them and move, maneuver them onto a conveyor belt in the back there. So I thought this was, you know, firstly very good eye candy, but what is this type of technology, assuming that it continues to mature and becomes really cheap to produce and install in your warehouse, what does this mean for the workers who would be working in this warehouse otherwise? Well, um, for one thing, we could look to the YouTube comments, which I would say in general is not a good source of economic <laughs> predictions. But you can see that it's rather pessimistic. They're not excited for the prospects for these warehouse workers. Uh, so why might people feel this way? Well, actually, there's a lot of uh, theory and literature to support this idea called skill bias technological change, which is this general idea that cognitive workers tend to be augmented by technology, while physical workers usually stand to be substituted for by technology. And as examples of this, it seems that software developers are augmented by cognitive technologies like machine learning, while on the other hand, truck drivers seem like they're in competition with autonomous vehicles and may see depressed employment opportunities as this technology continues to mature. But I think the actual situation is much more subtle, and we might be able to see some interesting new dynamics and some more subtleties if we refine our focus from coarse labor categories, like cognitive versus physical, 
to more specific workplace tasks and skills that define and distinguish between different job titles. So let me give you another example to try to get at some of these complex dynamics. This is my favorite example. Uh, here we have an artisanal good produced by a highly skilled worker. Here we have two unskilled workers. But with some technology, we can use these unskilled workers to produce this artisanal good. So now let's ask the same question from before. What does this uh, technology mean for employment for these workers? Well, here, it sort of seems like maybe it'll decrease demand for the high-skilled dancer because maybe it's not so, um, such a good in investment to try to get those costly skills. Maybe this means increased employment for these low-skilled workers since we can now use them to produce this good. So maybe those warehouse workers from before have a future as pseudo-dancers. Who knows? Uh, so here we can see the first example that maybe there's some subtlety going on when we refine our focus a little bit. So let me give you some more examples to try to highlight this a bit more. If we use coarse labor categories like cognitive and physical or routine and non-routine, then it becomes difficult to distinguish the key features that define different occupations. So for example, let's consider medical doctors and civil engineers. These are both occupations that would fall into the same traditional categories. They are highly educated workers, well paid, they perform cognitive, non-routine work, and yet their skill sets are pretty much non-transferable. It's really difficult for workers to move from one career opportunity uh, to the other. And the sets of technologies that these workers are likely to interact with, act, uh, interact with will probably be very different. So if we want to understand how the nature of work for these workers will change or diverge over time, we would need to refine our focus into the specific workplace tasks and skills of these occupations. Here's another often cited example from the literature. Here I'm, I'm making reference to Jim Besson's work. He's an economist at BU. Uh, he found that surprisingly, national employment for bank tellers actually rose with the increased adoption of automated teller machines, or ATMs. In his analysis, he points to two factors that contributed to this trend. The first seems to be pretty well understood by economists. It's called demand elasticity. Basically, ATMs made it cheaper to open bank branches, and so more bank branches opened nationwide, and that boosted employment opportunities. The other factor that Besson, Besson points to I thought was much more interesting, and I was a bit surprised to learn that there wasn't a very detailed model for this. Basically, the fundamental skill requirements of a bank teller shifted from requiring workers who could do money handling clerical uh, work to instead requiring workers who could use social skills more effectively. And this is because the bank tellers of today act more as customer service representatives and sales representatives. So according to Besson's analysis, if you wanted to completely understand the relationship between ATMs and bank tellers, you would again need to refine your focus to more specific types of workplace skills if you wanted to capture this shift towards social skills. So this got me thinking, how can I think about labor in the US that allows me to connect specific workplace tasks and skills to the larger uh, labor trends that we talk about today, like job polarization and bottlenecks to spatial mobility? So here, I'm imagining the US labor system as a multi-layered complex system. At the top layer, all the way on the left, I'm thinking about different labor markets. And I'm thinking about these as different cities, which may support greater uh, amounts of cognitive workers, and more rural areas that might have better support for manufacturing work. But I, I also want to consider these labor markets are not in isolation. right? There's flows of goods and ideas and workers between all these different places. How should we understand one labor market? Well, one way is to look at the employment distribution in that city. So now we're talking about this middle layer here. But I think if we can uh, improve on that a little bit and understand workers' abilities to transition between different career opportunities within that labor market, that could be some valuable insight into the economic resilience of a different labor market uh, to things, to perturbations to the status quo. So for example, to changing nature of work or to changing employment opportunities from technology or offshoring or any reason. So what factors might contribute to a worker's ability to move between employment opportunities? Well, we know from the literature that skill matching is an important factor when workers try to fulfill uh, employment opportunities. And also, we might identify interdependencies between pairs of skills as well to approximate things like complementarity as an example. So skills that are complements are more valuable when a worker has both compared to when a worker has just one or the other. So here we see a cartoon with connections within each layer and also between each layer. 
And I think uh, the goal for most of this talk is to try to fill in this cartoon with actual empirical structure. And here, what I mean by structure is empirical pathways along which labor dynamics tend to co-occur, or tend to occur. So things like how do workers move between employment opportunities, where are their bottlenecks to their ability to move between careers, and uh, spatial mobility between different labor markets as well. And if we can do that, if we can actually identify a refined empirical structure, then that opens up some new possibilities for analysis. For example, we could look at how specific examples of technology impact the demand for specific skills. So imagine some machine vision algorithm that performs some visual task and then impacts the demand for human labor that would otherwise perform that visual task. We can capture that with high specificity, hopefully with this type of framework, and see how that microscopic perturbation in combination with other technologies that interact with other skills accumulate and diffuse throughout the entire system to produce the macroscopic labor trends that we talk about more frequently today. Things like job polarization and bottlenecks to spatial mobility. OK. So uh, to get started, uh, basically this, the ordering of projects in this talk is just how I chronologically explored them. So I started out naively thinking I could just leverage all three layers at once to try to understand the impact of technology uh, on labor in different US cities. OK, so to do this, we looked at a few different sets of job level predictions for how uh, susceptible to automation different job titles are in the US. We took each set of predictions and combined them with employment distributions in cities to produce this on average score that we're calling expected job impact from automation. Now, to be clear, by impact here, I don't think that most of that impact is technological unemployment. I actually think most of this impact represents changes to the status quo like what we saw for bank tellers shifting their uh, skill requirements. So here in this map, we're coloring different cities according to their expected job impact using one of these predictions. And you can see in general, the large coastal cities are looking a little more blue, indicating that they have less expected impact, while some of the smaller cities in the center of the country are looking more orange and red, indicating that they have greater expected impact. And we can go ahead and quantify this. So this scatter plot on the right here, we have city size on the x-axis as approximated by total employment in each city. And on the y-axis, we have the expected job impact. And we find that regardless of the set of job level predictions that we plug into this analysis, the same trend pops out. And that is that small cities face greater impact from automation in the foreseeable future. So now the question becomes, can we try to identify some features that might contribute to this differential impact of automation across cities of different sizes? And to do this as a first step, a natural thing to try is to look at employment distributions. But it's really hard to think about 750 different job titles all at once. So here, we're using ONET data, which details the specific skill requirements of each job title that we have employment data for in the US. And we're simplifying the task by clustering job titles based on their skill requirements into just five job types. And I'm using colors here to identify those types. And I've provided some example job titles from each of these job types. Now here on the right, on the x-axis, again, we have city size as measured by total employment. And on the y-axis, we're measuring the amount of employment in each job type in each city. And we see that for most job types, when we increase the city size, we see a roughly proportional increase in employment in that job type. However, there's one exception. These purple jobs look like they're growing much faster than proportional. So one way you might think about this is you may need more purple employment for the last 1,000 people that moved to your city compared to the first 1,000 people. So what are these purple jobs? Well, we can see some examples on the left there. Turns out they're things like mathematician and physicist, but also a chemist and biologist and computer programmer. There are also some managerial positions in there. So it seems like these are the workers who are prepared to use and improve cutting edge technology rather than compete with it, and also some of the workers who coordinate these specialists. So this is sounding like a division of labor story here. Now this is the first example I came into where we leverage the specific skill requirements of different jobs to gain some insights into the impact of technology, at least in cities. We use the skill requirements to, um, to identify these clusters of different job types here. So this motivated me to look a little more squarely at how support for different skills might contribute to economic resilience in cities. And when I went to look at the literature on this topic, I found that diversity was a major theme. The idea is that cities that are more diverse tend to be more resilient. But I found that when these studies were measuring diversity, labor diversity in different cities, they were using a really simple measure. 
basically just counting the number of unique job titles with employment in that city. So in general, small cities have employment for fewer different job titles compared to larger cities, which employ a greater number of unique job titles. But this measure ignores how employment is actually distributed amongst these different categories. So when we account for the employment distribution, we find that small cities have fewer bins, basically, but the employment is distributed more uniformly across these bins. And in larger cities, there's a greater number of bins, but the employment is distributed with a greater skew. So we can use some measures from information theory that allow us to normalize for the number of bins, but still measure the diversity based on the employment distribution. So here, let me tell you a few different ways that we use this idea. First, in the blue plot here, we're just looking at the employment distributions in different cities and applying normalized Shannon entropy to measure the diversity of those distributions. And we find that large cities exhibit greater specialization using this information theoretic measure. This green plot in the middle here, we're looking at skill distributions in different cities. So here, uh, each job title has a set of skill requirements, and we combine those skill requirements with the employment distributions in cities to produce a skill distribution for each city. And then again, we apply normalized Shannon entropy to these skill distributions. And again, we find some evidence that large cities are more specialized according to this information theoretic score. Uh, finally, we're using a slightly more sophisticated, multi-layered information theoretic measure for diversity called Thale entropy. In this case, you can think about this as the relative abundance of relatively specialized workers in each city. And again, we find evidence that large cities are more specialized according to this measure. So if large cities exhibit greater specialization, at least according to these information theoretic measures, what are the skill sets that seem to be associated with this type of trend? So to answer this question, we're going to do a little experiment where imagine I drop you into an unknown city and you observe the skills of some random workers around you. And just for example, imagine you observe a worker with computational or analytical skill. Well, this would be evidence that the city you're in is more specialized according to these information theoretic measures. Turns out there are other skill sets that tend to be more physical in nature that would instead indicate the city you're in is less specialized and has greater diversity according to these measures. We could do a similar exercise where we're trying to approximate the expected job impact in the city that we're in. And we find that the same skills that indicate greater specialization also indicate greater resilience to impact from technological change. And the same skills that exhibit that um, the same skills that tend to highlight less specialization indicate less resilience in those cities. So again here, some more evidence that we can see something about how technology is shaping the future of work in cities when we allow focus into specific skill categories. So this motivated me to return to this cartoon and to try to focus a little more squarely on each of the layers and actually identify the empirical structure that describes each of these sections. So to begin with, let's focus on the space of skills and try to identify structure here. So to do this, I'm going to leverage ONET data, which is a data product from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. They go out and survey actual workers and experts about different job titles and ask them how important the detailed list of uh, skills and tasks are to the completion of that job. By aggregating these responses, we arrive at an on average importance of each skill to each job. And by looking at how pairs of skills co-occur as important across different jobs, we can relate skills to one another here. Uh, in truth, we're also going to control for ubiquitous skills, so things like interacting with your peers or interacting with supervisors, so that we can better identify the skills that distinguish between different job titles. So here we're using revealed comparative advantage to achieve this. Uh, and you can see in this measure, basically we're comparing in the numerator the relative importance of this skill to this job compared to the relative abundance of this skill across all skills and all jobs in the denominator. And when this uh, and when the skill is relatively more important to that job than you would expect on aggregate, the revealed comparative advantage will have a score greater than one. And we will say that that skill is characteristic of that job. So here with this I function, it's just an indicator function to identify characteristic skills. So these methods are actually very, very similar to the product space analysis carried out by Cesar Hidalgo and Ricardo Hausman, where they examined national economies and their exports and when they related exports to one another, they produced what they call the product space. And they found that this space is characterized by the sparse periphery and this really dense center. And in general, they found that smaller economies tended to export the extraction goods in the sparse periphery of the space, while larger economies tended to export the more complex goods that occupy the dense center of this space. So in our analysis of occupations and skills, instead of nations and exports, we're using very similar methods, so we might expect to see something very similar. 
But in fact, what we see is really different. So here, this is a map to the space of uh, ONET skills. Each circle represents a different skill. And skills are connected if they tend to co-occur as characteristic across different job titles. Here, I'm coloring different skills according to their ONET task group, which is just a classification handed to us from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. So here, unlike what we saw in the product space with a dense core and a sparse periphery, we observe a highly polarized space of skills. And we can apply some community detection here and actually quantify that indeed it seems there are sensory and physical skills on the right. Some examples include manual dexterity, stamina, strength, and low light vision. And on the left, we have social and cognitive skills. So things like mathematics, complex problem solving, programming, but also persuasion and negotiation. So this is a pretty interesting data-driven result. Uh, we were just completely unsupervised in our treatment of this data. And in principle, the data could have told us there were any number of major skill types. But the data tells us that, in fact, there are just two. So that's an interesting thing to begin with. But what do these skill clusters in this polarization allow us to say about aggregate labor trends? So to begin to investigate here, we're going to relate different job titles to the skill network by projecting them onto the skill network by coloring in their characteristic skills with black circles. So here, for example, we're looking at dishwasher. And we can see that dishwashers use a lot of sensory physical skills. And we find that when we repeat this for occupations with higher annual wages, we observe a smooth transition from relying on sensory physical skills to instead relying on social and cognitive skills. We could do something similar for uh, whole urban workforces. So here, we're looking at the skill requirements for different jobs, combining those skill requirements with employment distributions in cities to create a skill distribution in each city, using revealed comparative advantage to identify the characteristic skills of each city, and then projecting cities onto the skill network with black circles. So somewhat similar to before, we find that larger cities with higher median household incomes exhibit this smooth transition from relying on sensory physical skills to instead relying on social and cognitive skills. So I thought this was pretty interesting because I think it draws some connections between what we found with our unsupervised analysis and some of the existing analytical and theoretical work on job polarization, and in particular uh, with David Otter's hollowing of the middle class. So in David Otter's analysis, he looked at a few different time periods. And in each time period, he ranked job titles according to their annual wage and then looked at the change in employment share for each bin of occupations according to their wage. In general, he finds this U-shape, which means that employment share is growing for low wage and high wage occupations at the expense of the employment share for middle wage occupations. He then went to try to explain this empirical trend in an analysis that relied very heavily on concepts about skills. He says that this trend has to do with differences between low skill, middle skill, and high skill work. So I started thinking, well, what are these skills? And is wage really necessarily skill? Can we do better? Is there a connection between what we've done and what they've done? So I see what, I see what David's done is to apply a top-down approach and to try to drill down and get as close to the bottom as, what he can, as he can. Well, on the other hand, we've done this bottom-up approach. We started with just skills data. We made no assumptions. We applied this unsupervised methodology. And we produced this polarized skill network. And we saw from before that. Reliance on these different skill sets that define the skill polarization allow, uh, predict differences in wages for different job titles. So I think there's a connection here. I think in particular that the sensory physical skills may be an approximation for David Otter's low skills, and that David Otter's high skills may be captured by our social and cognitive skill set in this analysis too. So that was good. Um, but I think we can leverage this skill network to see some new things as well by looking at the specific connections between pairs of skills on the network. So leveraging the specific topology here. Uh, we find in general that using data from the current population survey, we can observe how workers are moving between job titles during their career, during the two-year period that they contribute to that survey. And we find that these workers tend to move between occupations that require skills that are nearby on the network. We also find that in general, workers who begin in occupations that rely strongly on sensory physical skills can move pretty freely to other occupations that are similarly sensory and physical. Uh, in a related way, workers beginning in occupations that are heavily social and cognitive can move to other social and cognitive work. However, we also find that workers that begin in occupations that are straddling between these two skill sets appear to be unwilling or unable to transition to higher earning social and cognitive work. And actually, these three modes of behavior are reflected in national employment in the US when we bid employment according to its reliance on social and cognitive skills. 
So here, this is a uh, distribution of national employment, and we observe this trimodal distribution. The leftmost hump rep representing the sensory physical workers, the rightmost hump representing the social and cognitive workers, and the middle hump representing the workers that are straddling between these two skill sets. OK, so here we've identified some structure that describes the space of skills and allows us to say something about the labor dynamics that occur in the next level up, how workers are moving between different skill sets as they transition between job opportunities. So I thought this was promising. Let's, let's try to do it again. Let's try to identify some structure here to describe the space of jobs, and then maybe we can use that to describe dynamics in the next layer up. So similar to before, we're going to use ONET data to do this. But instead of relating specific skills to one another, we're going to relate job titles to one another based on the similarity of their characteristic skills. So in particular here, I'm using this measure for skill similarity, which is really just jacquard similarity, if you're more familiar with that. Uh, so what does this skill similarity score allow us to say, in this case, about the rates of workers transitioning between pairs of job titles, according to CPS data? To compare with, as a baseline, we're going to first consider a random mixing model that uses just the national employment of each job title in the US. We're also going to consider augmenting this random mixing model with some traditional coarse labor categories. So for example, looking at measures for uh, jobs reliance on cognitive and physical or routine and non-routine work, or also looking at jobs and their reliance on different ONET task groups. And we find that in these cases, using these coarse labor categories don't really yield an improvement over the random mixing model when we try to predict worker transition rates. However, when we instead leverage our skill similarity score, which uses uh, a very granular taxonomy of workplace skills, we do find an improvement in the model's ability to predict worker transition rates. So this is promising. Um, <clears throat> it means that we have a tool with which to map out the space of jobs a little bit based on skills. So I wanted to encode that information into a network. So here. This is similar to the scale network, except that this is a network of jobs. So cir circles here represent different job titles. And job titles are connected if they have a high skill similarity score. Similar to before, we see that this network is also pretty polarized. And when we look at the skills that distinguish occupations in these two clusters, we find that it seems to be uh, differentiated based on a reliance on sensory physical skills or social and cognitive skills. But if you want a more traditional measure, uh, jobs in these different clusters are also distinguished based on their annual wage. OK, so here we have some structure to describe this middle space. What does this structure allow us to say about the labor dynamics in the next layer up? So in particular, how are workers moving between different cities and different labor markets? So to, do, to answer this question, we're first going to project cities onto the job network. So here, I'm coloring in a subset of the, job, the complete job network that describes each city by coloring in the characteristic occupations in that city, so using revealed comparative advantage here to identify those. So here, we're projecting Boston by coloring in the occupations that are characteristic of Boston and the connections between those characteristic occupations. Here's another example. This is Houston, Texas, projected onto the job network. So how can we relate the workforce in Boston to the workforce in Houston using this information? Well, one way is to create what I'm calling an overlap network which looks at the occupations that are characteristic in both Boston and Houston. So here in this overlap network, we color in the occupations that are characteristic of both cities and the connections between those shared occupations. So here's another example. This is Madera, California, and Seattle, Washington, as well as their overlap network on the right here. So now when we compare these overlap networks, there are two features that jump out to me. The first is the number of nodes that are colored in. So this is just simply the number of shared characteristic occupations. The second thing that jumps out to me is that the top network seems to me to be more densely connected than the sparser network on the bottom. And you'll recall from before that we're encoding this skill similarity score into the edges of the network. And these skill similarity scores were predictive of worker transition rates between pairs of jobs. So cities that are more densely connected may offer greater career mobility for workers trying to move between those two cities. So to capture this idea, I'm proposing a measure I call city tightness. And you can see that this measure uses the skill similarity scores from before, as well as the characteristic occupations in each city. So how does this tightness score relate to spatial mobility of people moving between pairs of cities? To test this, we're going to look at two types of mobility data. The first is the number of people flying between city pairs in 2015. And the second thing on the right here is just census migration rates between pairs of cities. As a baseline, we're going to consider the gravity model. 
which uses the size of each city and the spatial distance between those cities. Next, we're going to consider augmenting the gravity model with this simple overlap calculation, which is just the number of occupations that are characteristic of both cities. And we do find notable improvements in the model's ability to predict these um, mobility rates. However, the best performance is yielded when we instead augment the gravity model using the city tightness score, which combines not only employment information, but also detailed skill information that defines each occupation here. OK, so we started the talk by looking at this cartoon. And I suggested that the task is to fill in this cartoon with empirical structure. And uh, I think we've done that. So here, these are the same three layers from before. We have our polarized skill network on the bottom. We have our job network in the middle. And then we have different cities represented on the top. And they have support for different types of workers. And I suggested that once we got to this stage, uh, we could, it enabled us to consider specific technologies and how those technologies interact with the demand for specific skills. And then we could begin to model how these perturbations accumulate and diffuse throughout the whole system. And this is an area of future work that I'm really interested to continue pursuing. I think uh, Eric and I have some, some ongoing work here to do this. Uh, and in thinking about this problem, I'm motivated by ideas from ecology on measuring the resilience of different ecosystems. So in ecology, we have descriptions of equilibrium behavior. For example, different populations grow according to logistic growth. But it turns out, based on that body of work, you can ignore those equilibrium behaviors and actually look at the network of species within ecosystems based on their mutualistic interactions. And you can use the density of connections between species to say something about the resilience of that ecosystem to uh, the removal of different species, for example, from rising acidity levels or rising temperatures. So by analogy, maybe we can use the connections between different jobs in a labor market or the connections between the supported skill sets in a different labor market to say something about economic resilience in those cities to changing labor demands as the future of work takes shape, from technological change or from offshoring or from any type of perturbation. So that's the idea. Um, <clears throat> I think that this type of granularity also offers some new possibilities in our ability to forecast the future of work. For example, we can clearly disentangle intercity dynamics and intracity dynamics by looking at these different layers within the system. And when we do this, we're offering some new tools to policymakers and individual workers who are trying to navigate the future of work. I'm also excited about the types of input data that this refined focus on granular skills enables us to consider. So for example, we could look at real-time skill trends by looking at uh, job posting websites like LinkedIn to see how workers are advertising their skill sets over time and to see how employers are advertising skill requirements of uh, available employment opportunities. I'm also interested in looking at patent data as a signal for which technologies may become mature in the foreseeable future. And as we improve our ability to relate examples of technology to specific skills that might be exposed, then we can incorporate patent data as a useful input into this granular framework at, for forecasting the future of work. Another area of input that I'm interested in, and I've sort of got started a little bit thinking about this, is to try to understand how AI technology itself is evolving by studying the AI research community. So to do this, I'm going to use data from the Microsoft Academic Graph. So this is a data set over the last 60 years of academic publications in journals and conferences. Uh, and in particular, I'm going to look at publications in the computer science subfields of pattern recognition, machine learning, natural language processing, and computer vision to approximate artificial intelligence research. So here, we're looking at how publications in those fields make reference to publications in other academic fields over time. And we see, uh, sorry, on the left here, we're looking at just the share of citations made to each field in each year. And on the right, we're looking at the share of citations normalized by the paper production in the referenced field. So this is, uh, I was actually, when I, when I thought about this second measure, I was thinking about when other fields make reference to AI research, how there's this exponential growth of papers. And you might want to control for that. So that was the idea here. So when we look at these two figures here, we see, interestingly, that there's been some dynamics over time. So for example, early on, psychology was as important to AI research as mathematics or computer science. But more recently, the field has become much more computational and relies almost entirely on publications in computer science and mathematics. 
We can also flip this around. So here this is how do other academic fields make reference to AI research over time. And again, we observe that things have changed over the, the last few years. So for example, prior to 1980, AI research was as important to psychology, philosophy, geography, and art as it was in mathematical publications and computer science publications. When we look on the plot on the right here, though, we can see that some fields seem to be not able to keep pace or not willing to keep pace with the growing amount of AI research. And several of these fields that are not keeping pace represent areas of social science. And of course, we've been interested in the economic impact of AI in most of this talk, but there's also social and societal implications of AI as well. So uh, for example, AI stands to combat many sources of social bias that we live with today. And examples from the literature include using AI to balance judges towards more equitable bail decisions, using computer vision algorithms to assess neighborhood safety from images, and uh, using AI-based hiring algorithms to combat gender bias in executive hiring decisions. However, there are also examples where AI systems have been deployed that contained unknowingly sources of social bias themselves. So for example, um, racial bias and facial recognition software. Uh, also in thinking about self-driving cars in particular, whenever a new technology reaches maturity, it opens up new possibilities for ethical and regulatory considerations. So we need to tackle those problems. And of course, we've been talking a little bit about job polarization here as technology shapes the future of work. So how can we balance growing bounty with growing wealth spread in the US at the same time? And of course, if you want to study these types of questions, the social and societal implications of a thing, you should probably engage the social scientists. They're spending their career understanding these things. So what factors of the AI research community may be inhibiting the flow of information between these communities? So to investigate first, we looked at the diversity of scientific impact within AI research across different research institutions. So here we're comparing the distribution of uh, AI authors AI paper production, and citations to AI papers across different universities and industry-based research institutions. And interestingly, we find that over time, diversity has been going down within this research community. Now, I know I see some of you out there are machine learning fans, and you're saying, you know, probably this is just an aggregate trend. All of science is going down. But uh, that's not true. So here's the same measures applied to many different uh, academic communities. And you can see that they're all going up. So this type of behavior, this decline in scientific diversity, uh, seems to be unique to the AI research community. So what factors might be producing this trend? Well, one thing is we find evidence for preferential referencing when we look at how AI research makes reference to other AI publications. So this is basically saying that over time, uh, institutions that already have accumulated a lot of citations for their AI publications are more likely to accumulate more citations moving forward. So this leads to big winners and big losers in terms of prominence within the AI research community. So how has the prominence of different AI research institutions changed over time? So to look at this, we're basically making a network of research institutions where, they're connect, where institutions are connected based on how often their AI research makes reference to AI research that was published at another institution. And then we're using PageRank here as a measure for prominence within the AI research community. So in the top here. And you can see that over time there's been some changes. So early on, for example, the most prominent research institutions were academic based and they were the usual suspects. MIT, Stanford, CMU, UC Berkeley were among the most prominent within the AI research community. However, more recently, there's been a shift. So it seems like about after 1985 or so, industry-based AI research institutions have been rising in prominence. And today, the most prominent institutions are Microsoft and Google. If we zoom in on just the most recent years, we can also see the sudden rise in prominence of many uh, Chinese institutions within the AI research community as well. So the rise of industry within AI research may be contributing to the gap between AI research and social science research because it turns out that areas of social science, including business, econ, poli-sci, sociology, and philosophy, do not appear to be keeping pace in their referencing to industry-based AI research based, uh, compared to the abundance of industry research within the AI research community. OK, so moving forward, um, I see that if we want to understand the impact of AI, there are three major categories that we should consider. How is AI shaping the nature of work? How is AI impacting social and societal well-being? And how is AI itself evolving over time? And I think that 
uh, these are not mutually exclusive categories. There's a lot of cross information to be considered here. And I've presented to you some of my contributions to each of these three areas, but I think there's a lot more interesting work to pursue here, and I hope to continue doing that. Finally, uh, it takes a village to raise a village idiot. So <laughs> I want to say thank you to the many people who have helped shape my academic journey. I'm especially thankful to Iyad, because um, just as uh, I took a gamble on the lab, you took a gamble on me. And I can be extremely stubborn, so I hope that I was worth the trouble. Also, I want to thank my wife, Catherine. She's been amazingly supportive throughout this, this whole crazy ordeal. Uh, so finally, uh, if you have questions later, most of this research is published already. So you can uh, follow up on those publications. And if you have questions now, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. So one thing you motivated us with was the kind of this best an idea that maybe jobs are changing over time, mm -hmm. right? The, the tasks they require. Um, but uh, some of the analysis kind of relied on the idea that jobs across different parts of the United States are actually identical, right? For a lot of this kind of um, city skill similarity. So um, obviously one exciting thing to think about is jobs varying across time, but have you thought about how we can think about jobs varying across space? Uh, I think that's an excellent point. Um, <clears throat> and I would start up by saying that even though our analysis uh, falls short in this, in this regard, we're still able to recover important labor trends using our analysis. So that's sort of a validation of the methods. So there's some value there. But I think we could definitely improve when we account for the variability of different jobs across different regions. And um, for example, uh, Probably you need to advertise yourself differently as a software developer in Silicon Valley compared to if you're in a middle of nowhere uh, town. So I think this is an area to improve. And I'm interested in looking at online data sources to complement the existing public facing data sources from the Bureau of Labor Statistics to achieve on this front. But that's a great suggestion, Seth. Thank you. Mikhail. Uh, so the, the the uh, fact that AI as a research field is decreasing in diversity, isn't that just a sign of a technology maturing and becoming economically more relevant? Because now you're comparing AI as a whole to, for example, biology, as if it's purely a research field, and it's, I feel, more of a technology, and you would see the same, for example, if you compare it to mobile computing or to transistors or things that go from academia to more sort of economical relevance? Yeah. Um, so I think there's an interesting discussion about how we're dividing up AI research communities here. And uh, I, made, I made this choice to chop it up this way. It was empirically informed, but not necessarily the right choice. I'll show you here. Um, <clears throat> so here. We're looking at different computer science subfields using the Microsoft Academic Graph data. And we're looking at how papers published in each subfield make reference to publications in other fields. And you can see that uh, machine learning, pattern recognition, and computer vision tend to be clustered together pretty consistently over time. NLP actually starts out as something else, becomes part of the same group, and then becomes something else again. Uh, and sure, you might think like these are maybe we're just bundling up specific subfields in a way and then comparing them to uh, aggregate fields. And maybe that's not fair. But actually, when you look at these are all um, paper production over time for different computer science subfields, the most productive fields tend to be these, these areas. So this seems to be a decent approximation for computer science at large in the last few years at least. Um, but I was still worried about this. Like Maybe this is just a signal that the AI research community is maturing, and we're in an optimization phase versus a exploration phase for that community. And I think probably that's, that's a good point. But in trying to think about how to compare this, I was interested in looking at medicine as another area. Because this is another area where you know, there's a lot of industry influence, and there's a lot of application focus. Uh, but even still, we see that, at least by most of the measures, the diversity of scientific impact is going up in that field. So I don't think that these two arguments uh, rule out what you're saying, but it's evidence to say that um, at least what we've done here is not out of the question. 
Alejandro. Hi, thanks for the talk. That was, that was amazing. Thank um, you. <laughs> so my question is, I feel a lot of your work on, on, the, on skills and labor is your, your, your purpose is definitely causal. So you want to give some causal explanation that can give you causal predictions about what will happen if you change X or if, or, or if X changes, right? Mm -hmm. However, the methods are mostly observational, so you work with observational data. So I, for example, the, the statistics that you show us is, do we explain more the variance than this alternative uh, model, which is a simple model that makes sense as a benchmark? Mm -hmm. So my question is, do you see uh, going into more causal uh, evaluation of your improved understanding of the system, like with natural experiments or with actual experiments? Yeah, so, so I, I think, think you've uh, read the situation very well. It's purely observation based, but I still think that the contributions here are worthwhile because the prevailing narrative aside from this is all about distinguishing labor uh, on cognitive versus physical or routine versus non-routine. And these are sort of the two axes. And I hope that this talk has provided some evidence that if you drill down deeper, you're going to see some more stuff. And that's valuable stuff. So uh, the goal of most of this was more of a proof of concept. But I agree that moving forward, it'd be great to uh, evolve towards prescribing uh, ideas and concepts for policymakers. Uh, however, we can use this analysis to actually rule out certain types of policymaking uh, ideas. So for example, I see a lot of retraining programs in the US that sound something like, well, uh, I see employment for truck drivers is likely to go down, but I see employment for software developers is going up. We'll just teach truck drivers to program, and it'll be great. Uh, but our analysis shows that actually the skills that truck drivers leverage are far away on the skill network compared to the skills that software developers require. So that doesn't mean you can't teach truck drivers to program, but it means that it might be difficult because a lot of the other skills that are required, you need to also um, give truck drivers the tools to obtain those skills. But in advancing towards more causal analysis, um, of course, the task is difficult because there's a lot of variables at play. But I think there is potential for doing some uh, natural experiment-based analysis. So for example, looking at how workers have been displaced by natural disasters, like looking at hurricanes in the Gulf Coast, um, and seeing, based on labor and skills, can we accurately recover how workers ended up distributed in other cities? And that could be at least some uh, evidence to support that this information is, is contributing causally to those uh, types of mobility. Eric. Oh, well. Seeing these presentations a, a number of times, um, yeah. So um, <laughs> and, and I think we've talked about a lot of it. But part of it that I hadn't seen before was some of this that you have up here about the, the changes in uh, concentration and, and, and diversity. <laughs> so the the in AI is becoming more concentrated, less diverse. And maybe you could just say a little bit more about that. That we understand better. Yeah. That, that's that's that. There's a, a smaller number of percentage of the authors are accounting for a bigger share of the citations? Is it at the institutional level, the author level, the paper level, all those different levels? It's, it's at, at the, the institution, institution level. level. Let me show you some examples here. So like you showed the, the rise of Japanese, I'm uh, sorry, Chinese uh, institutions. That would go the opposite way. But despite that, there's more concentration at the... So what we're doing is uh, looking over each decade, yeah. looking at uh, the, basically the probability distribution uh, on the number of citations or the number of papers published by different research institutions. So this year, MIT published, I don't know, 100 papers that would be categorized as AI research. So MIT contributes to the 100 paper bit. So these are the different distributions for each decade. And we apply a Gini coefficient to measure diversity for each of these distributions. And that's what I mean by diversity in this case. So MIT is the larger percentage of the papers uh, in the past? Uh, I'd, I'd have, have to, to double, double check, but uh, I would expect so. Yeah. They have a larger percentage of the papers. In the past. It's a, div it's it's a, a um, distribution level measure, so it's not an individual university. So it's assessing the whole community. The top, you know, university, which I assume. Oh, oh, so that's yeah. this, this plot, this prominence thing, the page rank thing. That is a per institution measure for what I'm calling prominence. So the top institutions are they yeah. account for a bigger share than they did in the past? Is that what I'm not sure. sure. No, you can't conclude that from these two measures. I'd have to go back and look at that. And 
it's also at the, at the individual author level? We just looked at the institution level because early on we were. Um, so this is this this plot here, for example, which is like the, the showing that Chinese institutions are on the rise. This is look at the AI publications that MIT produced, and look at create a network by looking at, for example, how did those publications make reference to Stanford's AI publications? Do that for every pair of institutions. You create this network, and you apply PageRank, which is a measure for centrality, and I'm calling that prominence. Sandy. Um, having lived through some of that, <laughs> um, these fields evolve over the time. So I came from the university, and it was originally very academic, mm -hmm. and then it became like, startup companies and companies, and then people really began doing stuff. Right. And so the mix of people involved was uh, was different. The economic consequences of doing personal. Of doing that was very different. Uh -huh. like data and a million people want to be data scientists. And so, so, you know, when you say it becomes concentrated, uh, I'm thinking about, you know, when people join the sort of AI, an AI field, they have to fit in, they have to be part of the, the crowd. Yeah. And so that's a natural concentration type of, a, of effect. And as it becomes hotter and hotter, you're going to get more and more of that concentration because of it. It's not necessarily bad. It's a, it's a result of explosive growth. Um, and so I wonder you know, if you normalize by that for those different things, if it would change. The other thing that happens, of course, is that there's stuff that really is AI research that would never show up in AI literature. Mm -hmm. It's just the same tool. People use machine learning everywhere. Right. And it would have been AI 20 years ago. It's not even mentioned. Right. That, right? So, so we're relying pretty heavily on the Microsoft Academic Graph to characterize different publications into the correct subfield. Yeah. Um, and they're doing that by doing keyword analysis and some uh, semantic analysis as well. Presumably, uh, they didn't. They didn't define what AI is today and then classify all papers according to it. They've I think it's adaptive. Some, yeah. Something better than that. Right? that. What was called AI at the time yeah. is, is used to characterize the older papers. And my, my experience with that particular data source is that um, they're relying very hard, uh, very much on particular general, particular conferences, things like that. Yeah. But, you know, Back in the day, I used to dominate some of those things. Now I don't publish them at all. So I'm not doing AI, except that I am. Then they might, we'd have to double check. We can look you up in the data. You're an outlier, Sandy. Give us that. The other thing. But some of the same, like, for instance, with transitions of jobs, right? So it would be really interesting to ask also how the frequency of transition happens. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of taken out of what you're doing. That's right. right? It absolutely is. Because we're, we're stuck using uh, current population survey data, so we just get a two-year snapshot at everybody. So if they happen to change occupations during that two years, we capture that. So it's not this longitudinal thing. That's another area we could improve. We also hate to know that there was a social skills. Yeah. Well, they have uh, like persuasion, negotiation, Interacting with peers, interacting with supervisors. Well, there's still. People run the yeah, yeah. And then there are. Um, I suspect that there's some real differences there. Yes. So take truck drivers. Yeah. You know, truck drivers have to uh, talk to the person that they're delivering the stuff to, make sure they're not getting cheated, yeah. jolly them along because they're the customers of what, you know. And this driving thing happens in the middle. Yeah. And the only thing that's getting nice. automated is the driving thing in the middle. So yeah, it's true. Um, yeah, I'm not saying that ONET is a panacea. There are a lot of other grievances. So like programming, for example, is one skill in this analysis. But you know, good luck getting a job saying, I know how to program in Silicon Valley. You're going to need to be more specific. Another favorite example is installation is one skill. And it's very important to plumbers and software developers. But probably they're not doing the same thing when they're installing. So. So again, despite these shortcomings, we're able to validate against and recover some external trends that we care about. 
So it means that our analysis is useful, but there's room for improvement. I'm not suggesting that obviously there's limitations, but yeah. these might be areas to, to focus, to look at, because you might see very different perspectives there. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. So first, fantastic presentation, which I'm really excited about. Uh, and so I'm curious about this graph. Uh, like, there's a bunch of stuff that's not highlighted, right? And so I assume that means some of the top institutions, so the one on the top right, uh, like are staying on the top. Uh, and so one of my first reactions before like fully looking at it was, oh, there's this huge rise in like Chinese production, or at least like centrality in the network. And I'm curious if you've done like more exploratory analysis on uh, other countries, like and how countries are comparing and whatnot. And if you think that China is on the rise, or this is just like it kind of shows that it might be, but there's actually like plenty of things ahead. Or... Uh, yeah, I, I don't, I haven't looked at how other countries are represented in this data. We looked at China because it was sort of like an obvious cherry picker for a reviewer. Like, hey, what about China? Like, okay. Um, and it's there. The data, the data answers the call. Good. Um, the other thing is that looking at the most recent years is a little bit uh, suspect because publications from 2016 are still accumulating references. So the really big hits may not have distinguished themselves from other publications yet. Uh, so it's hard to then forecast forward. And actually, if we reran this analysis using the last two years of data, it might look a little bit different. However, I suspect you would still see that Chinese universities have increased their rank within this community. But yeah, good questions. Ziv? Yeah, so um, it seems to me that like, the way you've kind of gone about your research is finding these really kind of interesting immersive data sets that kind of provide this really kind of high resolution representation into kind of the dynamics of what's going on. And I guess, I'm curious, like, since you're really relying on kind of the nature of those data sets, like, do you think there's any kind of systematic limitations or dark, like, black holes, like, that it's not covering, and how you think about how it would, like, impact your results if there are these kind of, like, dark spots in those data sets? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the ONET data, for example, is a really costly data set to produce, uh, but it's, it's supposed to be uh, nationally representative. So that's valuable, but uh, as a consequence, because of the cost and because of the representativeness, uh, there's a, some specificity that's lost. So for example, the installation thing and the programming thing. Um, so I do think that it'd be really valuable to build on this analysis by looking at more adaptive and more real-time data sources. And for this, like I, I mentioned, maybe looking at patent data, looking at trends in AI technology itself, and looking at online data sources where uh, for example, on LinkedIn, you can say you have whatever skills you want. So there's this new complexity to the problem where you need to reduce what people are saying about themselves into skills that you can recognize and work with and compare to other people. Uh, but you get a lot more granularity from a temporal perspective. And you can see new skills emerge faster in this type of data compared to when you're waiting for annual ONET data to pop up. So yeah, it's a really good point, and I think it's, it's an area to improve. But it would be at the cost of representativeness. That's another thing. Giannis. Um, I, uh, it's kind of a follow-up question or related. So um, you showed how, uh, I don't know, retraining truck drivers to programmers might not be the best idea, and how your model can, can show other occupations that might be more better related or better suited for retrainability. Um, but your data set, I mean, maybe question regarding the data set, does the data set consider the United States as a closed system? Because I can imagine that some jobs that might be, based on your data set, might be a good idea to retrain from A to B, in reality move to other countries, mm -hmm. and therefore might not be a good idea to try to train everybody for that. Right. And I don't know, maybe there's a fourth layer to the yeah. model that considers international movement of occupations or skills or is that something that the model can even give you or would that have to be something on top? I think that in principle you could add a fourth layer that is international um, and that obviously workers move between different countries and I expect even that if you applied the same type of analysis in other countries you might find slightly different results. Uh, for example, as I understand it, manufacturing in Germany is not as impacted by robotics as it is in the US. 
Um, also, when we, we're working with a team in China to try to repeat our city level analysis for Chinese cities, and we found that actually there's a distinction between Chinese cities that have a government presence and those that don't, and that that actually moderates the result we found for US cities. Um, so yeah, things change in other countries. Um, but however, we're somewhat limited because the type of skills data we used for our analysis here and all the pros and cons associated with that, this type of data is absent from most other countries. Um, so we would have to overcome that hurdle. And I guess the best I can offer right now, uh, for example, what we're doing with China is uh, if two job titles are the same, we make the assumption that a software developer in the US is just like a software developer in China and then carry on. And of course, there's some, some issues, potential issues with that assumption. But it does sort of inhibit us from going the next level up. But yes, definitely an area for future work. There's also this whole thing called microeconomics. Yeah. <laughs> uh, macro, macro theory and general yeah. behavioral models, which you know, don't feature here, but um, it would be all the same with all that. They're really, really hard. Um, I think uh, with this, maybe we should thank the, the audience and, and uh, ask you guys to, to move, to leave, and then come back later when there's food and things. Thanks, guys.